presentation is not mine. Um, I want to give all the tribute to Malia DeVivo. She is the um, ungulate research scientist for uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and her main focus is on chronic waste disease. All right, so what is chronic waste disease? Uh, hang on one sec. Okay. So what is chronic waste disease? So chronic waste disease is a prion that is um, a type of protein that can cause, a prion is a type of protein that can cause disease in animals and humans by triggering normally healthy proteins in the brain to fold abnormally. Um, so these prions um, can turn into an infectious protein and they, they can cause a sponge-like lesion in the brain. And currently, there's no vaccines or treatments, and uh, it's 100% fatal for all cervids. Hang on one second. Um, so on the left here, you can see um, PRPC, which is a cervid. Um, prion that's a that looks like a normal protein um, prion and then on the right there you can see the disease causing form of the prion protein with which is a misfolded protein um, and then you'll see mad cow disease the prpbse um, prion for bro which is a prion for bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Um, it's not the same. So that whole figure right there is basically saying that it's not the same as cervid prion protein, the PRPC, um, meaning that not all prions diseases will affect every species, as most are species specific. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So prion diseases or prion Diseases can be acquired, spontaneous, and genetic. Um, some of being acquired are Kuru and variant CJD. Uh, spontaneous is um, could be CJD as well. And then genetic, um, GSS, and FFI. And then Something to highlight here is um, the uh, BSC is zoonotic and it is causing, and it, it's zoonotic causing VCJD. So um, chronic wasting disease is, like we said earlier, um, it is species specific. Um, so it's cervidae family. Um, so it only affects moose, elk, deer, and caribou, um, both species of, of deer, um, whitetail and mule deer. So impacts of chronic waste and disease Oops. Impacts of chronic waste and disease um, varies between increased wildlife collisions, changes to age structures and genetics, altered predator prey dynamics, and populate and in return population declines. Um, <clears throat> so for um, the increased wildlife vehicle collisions. Um, cervids that have chronic wasting disease, um, they are less, they're less scared of um, human presence. So when they're in the final stages, they, um, they see humans, they see cars, and they're not, their uh, natural instinct is to run away or run um, away from that person or that car. Um, 
So when they have chronic wasting disease, this, that natural instinct is taken away and you'll see more um, increased wildlife vehicle collisions and you'll see more predator prey dynamics because they're less scared of predators. Um, so they'll get preyed on easily. And then there'll be um, changes to the age structure because um, the, the, the disease takes a couple years for it to be fully present in the animal. Um, so those, it'll affect those um, later age, age class animals. And then in return, it'll um, eventually decline the population. Um, most CWD infected animals look normal, just like this elk here. Um, it's not till the in, end stage of its life where it starts showing clinical signs of um, of um, wasting the wasting away part of the animal. Um, and then, so for <coughs> for testing, we take out two lymph nodes out of the out of the neck of the deer or elk or any cervid. And we take those and we, um, we take those to Waddle over in uh, WSU, the diagnostic um, laboratory over there. And the only way to know if the animal has CWD is to test. And so for the end stage, um, it looks like this. Um, there'll be brittle antlers and velvet will be retained. Um, they'll be drooling. They'll be wide-based stance and uncoordinated. Um, and they'll be emaciated. Uh, basically when they're in that final stage, they're basically a zombie and they walk around like um, nobody can touch them basically. And the, the waste and away part is the big one. They'll, they'll just be skin and bones. And so it's very uncommon. It's very uncommon to find an animal like this in this stage. Most of the times they'll get predated before they look like this elk here. Um, so it's very surprising. Actually, Malia DeVivo, the, the research scientist that uh, gave me this slideshow, she took this picture over in, I think, Wyoming. Um, and so it's very rare to find an animal like this in this stage because they're usually either predated or they get hit by a car or um, they get shot by a hunter or something under that nature. <laughs> so transmission. Um, so there's different avenues of transmission. Um, but uh, direct transmission could be through saliva, and that could be through nose-to-nose -nose contact um, when a deer, elk, or any cervid goes up to another animal and touches that nose with another animal. Um, that could transfer that saliva. Or even if there's um, currently in Washington state, you can bait animals for hunting. Um, so if there's a salt lick or if there's corn that's feeding the animals, um, saliva on that, on that food can transfer easily in that way too. Um, urine that can transfer, that can be a direct transfer, um, transmission, I should say. And that could be in the ground and could be, could also be indirect as well. Um, so the animal could urinate on the ground and the other deer or elk species could walk and touch it and then they would immediately be affected. Um, same for feces. And then also for, for feces, um, I didn't know this until actually a couple of days ago, but the nursing fawns, um, the mother will um, basically clean the, the fawn and clean the animal's rectum and to get rid of the scent of the fawn so that it can't be tracked by 
predators. Um, so if this happened and the, the mother had CWD um, or the um, any animal had it and then licked another animal or touched any feces, it sounds gross, but if it touched any feces, then it could be uh, directly or indirect um, affected. And it's found in all tissues and blood. So when an animal dies and um, is either shot or it's naturally died in the woods, um, any blood or tissue that's left in the woods, it'll stay in the ground, in the soil for years and years and uh, can be easily transmitted through just the soil as well. <laughs> So distribution in North America. Oops. Um, so currently, um, I believe it's in 31 states. It's either 30 or 31. I think 31 because Florida was added this year. Um, but it first was detected in the 1960s in Wyoming and in Colorado. And then it was later um, transferred throughout the whole United States, um, well, throughout the United States, and then up into Canada, four, four provinces in Canada. And then in closest to us in 2019 was found in Libby, Montana, and in 2021 in Riggins, Idaho. And so... Um, I, I believe in Libby, Libby, Montana was about 50, it was detected about 50 miles away from our, from our border. And then Riggins, um, also really close as well. And then, so you can see here in the, in the uh, picture here, we have CWD and free ranging populations um, in the lighter gray. And then the known distribution prior to 2000 uh, free ranging um, in the darker gray. And then CWD in captive facilities in yellow. Um, so like in, in farms or anything like that. And then in, uh, in red, CWD in captive facilities current. So Washington CWD status. Um, Currently, there's no cases detected um, here in the state, um, but the testing is limited due to personnel and funding that we have. Um, and then the risk of natural transmission increased significantly in the last several years with new detections um, close to our state in Montana and Idaho, like I talked about earlier. And rules and regulations are aimed at reducing human-assisted CWD transmission. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but um, definitely more can be done, um, but rules are put in place to restrict that transmission rate. So past and present CWD surveillance, so the history of CWD surveillance, um, like I said in the, in the start of this talk, uh, started in the 1960s. And um, the syndrome in captive mule deer were in Colorado, um, mid 1960s, and then cl classified as a TSE in um, 1978, I believe. Um, and then captive mule deer and elk in Wyoming were diagnosed with CWD thereafter. And then in 1980 through 1990, free ranging elk and deer were diagnosed with CWD in Colorado and Wyoming. And then Washington started testing suspected animals um, in the uh, late 1990s. And then early 2000s through um, 2010, the federal funding to test statewide occurred. And then in uh, 
early 2000s as well. The carcass transport uh, WAC was adopted. And that was basically limiting um, the transfer of um, carcasses between state lines, lim limiting that between state lines. And then in um, 2019, Montana detect within CWD within 50 miles of our border here in Washington. <clears throat> and then in 2021, legislative funds to begin uh, systematic surveillance um, happened for, for our state. And uh, that's how we have our uh, chronic waste and disease um, technician jobs, and then also our check stations throughout the whole east side of the state. And then Idaho detects CWD for the first time in 2021 as well. So our current surveillance program um, is throughout the whole eastern side of the state. Um, so region one is the whole east side of the state. Um, and that focuses on adult deer and elk primarily because that's mainly what's in our east side of the state. Um, we do have moose that come through, but that's not our target species because um, our main focus is on deer and elk. Um, primarily sample harvested is samples are on harvested and roadkill animals. Um, that's where the majority of ours are coming from. And then we also collaborate with tribes, the Department of Transportation, meat processors and taxidermists. They all um, con contribute to our samples and um, our data collection. And then we also have our voluntary submissions where um, people can uh, voluntarily do it on their own. Um, and then we also have our check stations throughout the whole east side of the state, which are, occur during um, hunting seasons. So the modern firearm season, um, early and late. And um, we also do it by appointments, house calls, and we look at carcass pits, at DOT pits, um, and then roadways, mail-in and drop-off kiosks. Drop-off kiosks, um, I believe happened last year. We created those where we basically have a box um, that is, um, is locked and it has an opening at the top, almost like a mailbox, and people can um, submit their, their heads of their deer into this, um, into this kiosk and then we'll sample it the next day um, after collecting it. So there's there's many different ways that we collect our samples um, but it just varies the time of the year and um, especially like during the hunting seasons. So how can we protect cervid populations? Our goal is to keep CWD out of the state by regulating transportation of cervids and carcasses. That is our, that's our main goal is um, limiting that and trying to control the, the influx coming into the state. So here you'll see, I believe this is four different counties um, in Wisconsin. And um, what happened was um, from these zip codes um, in Wisconsin from 2016 to 2017, um, 32,000 deer were represented, um, harvested in Wisconsin. And um, 26 of them were in Alaska, two in Hawaii that aren't on this map but it shows you the dispersal rate or the dispersal of throughout the state of throughout the states of um, where they're transporting these deer from. So 32,000 deer and you can see how many of these deer went throughout the whole United States. 
Um, and that was in 2016 and 2017. So quite a large number of deer are, were being um, transferred throughout the state. And, and uh, Wisconsin is um, a state that does have chronic wasting disease and did have it at that time. Um, so this is a diagram where CWD is located throughout the body, which puts um, a susceptible population at risk. Um, this, this will basically show you um, the parts that we can test. So we can test all the lymph nodes, we can test the spinal cord, we can test the brain, the eyeballs, the spleen. Um, so there's uh, different options to take for sampling the deer for chronic wasting disease, but the, the majority of the time we're just taking the two lymph nodes out of, um, out of the neck because that's the easiest to, to retain from the deer. And then we also take the front two incisors, the front two teeth of the deer to age the deer as well. And then there's, um, there's been an update on the restrict to import um, certain parts of the deer and elk and moose. Um, so feel free to, on your own time, to um, go back and click on this uh, um, whack that we have for um, the law that's put in place for um, transferring deer, elk, moose, or caribou throughout the throughout the state. Um, basically, with that law, um, you can have meat, you can only transport meat that has been deboned in the state or province where it was harvested. And skulls and antlers with velvet removed, antlers attached to the skull plate or upper canine teeth, from which all the soft tissue has been removed. And then hides or capes without heads attached. Um, so that's the basically what the law states, and then finish taxidermy mills. Um, so properly pro process and dispose of carcasses, avoid cutting through bone, spinal cord, and brain, as that's um, what we use typically to, um, to test. Um, field dress game at kill site when possible. Um, just to limit that uh, that uh, proximity of where you harvest that deer, limit it to that to that specific area instead of transferring all those prions to um, far away places. And then, obviously, avoid feeding CWD positive meats to other animals, as we don't know um, the severity behind that. Um, but um, yeah, if you do have a CWD positive animal, definitely um, think before feeding that to other animals. Um, and then dispose of, to dispose of any inedible parts in the household trash that goes to the landfill. landfill. And get it tested because it's free. Harvested and salvaged roadkill deer and elk in eastern Washington state can be um, can be tested for free. Um, it's all voluntary, um, but you can go on our website here and you can check out details on how, when, and where the samples are collected throughout the time of the year. And then, um, like I said earlier, check stations are open um, during the general modern firearm season. So through October until mid-November. Mid, uh, uh, this coming up weekend, we'll have a couple, Saturday, Sunday, we'll be doing uh, check stations up north. And then the following Saturday, Sunday, we'll be also doing check stations up north in Spokane area. And then um, if you do harvest a deer or salvage a deer or elk, um, you can look up your test results online um, and that you just go on our website um, 
the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife website, type in CWD test um, results lookup. And in that you, um, it usually takes about four to six weeks um, based on the pass. It just takes about that time for the WSU to process those samples. And after they process that, it'll be recorded on our website. You'll type in your wild ID and um, it'll populate your results for, for your deer or elk. And then, so you can check out um, this regulations map. Um, it's just nice to know before you go to another state um, where uh, importing carcasses are banned um, and uh, different other um, regulations that the state might have. Um, you can click on any state and it'll, it'll show you all the rules and regulations that they have, um, like baiting, feeding, um, dif different regulations that they might have makes it easier for the hunter or anybody that's going out of state. And then this one, um, this one is just um, another good website to have because it shows you the carcass transport regulations um, and what it'll, it'll point it out state by state as well. Um, so another, um, so for these, um, another state provincial, provincial fish and wildlife agency notifies you that your harvested cervid is positive for C CWD, um, within 24 hours that you are notified that you have a positive, um, animal with CWD, um, you would need to contact the wildlife program at that number there. And um, then WDFW would help you properly dispose of um, any of the, the risk meat that you wouldn't wish to consume. And we have, um, we actually have incinerators up, um, I believe in Spokane that can it takes an incinerator at a certain temperature. I don't know the exact temperature, but it takes the incinerator um, a certain temperature to actually um, basically disintegrate the prion, the protein, because um, it's so hardy that it, it'll, it'll withstand certain temperatures. So it needs to go to, to a specialized incinerator where it can burn it to a, a certain level. Um, report sick or dead animals. If you go on to our website as well, um, you can go to the species and habitat, habitats bar and then click on wildlife diseases and then you can report, excuse me, dead or sick or injured animals. Um, and this will just notify us if, um, if there's an animal that could be a suspect for chronic waste disease. Here's our resources. And like I said, um, this, this whole talk was provided by Malia DeVivo. She's the Ungulate Research Scientist based out of Spokane. Um, her email's there. So if you have any questions for her, um, if you have any questions for me, I think Elizabeth provided my email.